Okay, so welcome to lesson 11. Uh, those of you joining me on the video, feel free to post questions if you have them afterwards in that document. Otherwise, I'll answer questions at the end of the lesson. So we're gonna look at lesson 11, which is mutations. And this is the last lesson of our unit. And we're going to use this lesson as well as this understanding of mutations to kind of piggyback our way into unit three, where we look at evolution and how this lesson and this unit as a whole ties into the idea of evolution. That's kind of like what I'm gonna set the foundation for with regards to this lesson. So a mutation is a change of the DNA sequence or sequence order of those DNA nucleotides, A, T, C, and G. They can happen randomly uh, as a result of radiation, chemicals, radioactive uh, components in the environment. UV light is another big one, but the, for the most part, uh, they can be, they're, for the most part, they're random. Uh, these mutations usually don't get passed on in any way, shape, or form or show up too often as the cells have a really good way of defending themselves. That checkpoint at interphase will allow the cell to determine whether or not there are any errors in the genetic code. And if there are any errors, it can allow that cell to go through what's called that program cell apoptosis. And so the cell is really good at determining if there are any errors within the genetic information. And as a result of that, prevents that mutation from either being propagated within that host or that person or being passed on to their generational offspring. Now, the most important component here that I have are the two types of mutations. The first mutation we're gonna look at is point mutation. This is the most important thing because we talk a lot about it in this lesson as well as in the unit to come. A point mutation is a mistake in a single base, a single base. So if you take a look at the original DNA here, where that base pair coding of ACA exists, a mutated copy has that mutation in that G, a single base pair substitution, this one is called, where one wrong base is substituted for another. In this case, the C was substituted for a G. We also have an insertion, which is the insertion of, if you take note at the code from the original DNA, ACA again, an insertion of that T nucleotide, that tyrosine, in between the A and the C, it's a base pair that's inserted that shouldn't normally be there. And then lastly, we have what's called the deletion, where as the name implies, one of the base pairs is deleted. That C in between the A is deleted and removed from the coding copy. So those are very important aspects of mutations, the point mutation specifically, I will be asking questions about this for the next maybe like 10 lessons for this unit and for the next unit. So just be cognizant of that. The second is chromosome mutations and there are multiple chromosome mutations. These are larger scale mutations that happen to entire chromosomes like monosomy or trisomy that we looked at in our earlier unit. So the first is called a translocation. This is where an entire piece of chromosome moves to a non-homologous chromosome. So when I say non-homologous, it's very important that you understand and recognize what that means because what I'm referring to is DNA moving from, for example, chromosome one to chromosome seven. <coughs> Pardon me. Chromosome one and chromosome seven are non-homologous. So a piece of that genetic information is trimmed off of chromosome one and it's lacking here. Whereas chromosome seven is perfectly content with its information that it has and it doesn't need anything extra. But in this case, that piece of information from chromosome one is added to chromosome seven. That's called a translocation, a translocation. So an entire chunk of one, uh, one chromosome gets attached onto a non-homologous chromosome. And when I say non-homologous, again, I mean it's the non-paired chromosome that it's attached onto. Chromosome one and chromosome seven are completely different. If it was attaching onto chromosome, uh, the homologous pair of chromosome one, it would still have negative impacts, but not as bad as a non-homologous attachment. One final note here with regards to that uh, is that this is not crossing over. There is not an equal sharing of genetic information amongst these chromosomes. It's not that chromosome seven shares some of its information with chromosome one, not the case. 
Okay, it's not the case. Translocation is not crossing over. Okay, the next one I want to talk about is deletion. And as again, the name, as the name implies, there is a deletion of a piece of the chromosome. A piece of that chromosome is lost. These can be quite harmful. They can also have no effect at all, but it really depends on the chromosome number and where specifically that chromosome is altered. So in this example, I have the chromosome genes, one, two, and three, and the deletion is removing that chunk of information, that chunk of chromosome, in this case, number the section two, and it's completely removed. Now, it's important to note here, this is not a base pair. This is a sequence of base pairs, right? Chromosomes are made up of, of hundreds of thousands of strings of nucleotides, and I'm not just removing one single nucleotide like we saw in our point mutations. I'm removing an entire chunk of a chromosome, and that's what we call a deletion alteration. Duplication is when one or more of the parts of the chromosome is repeated. So it can be repeated once or twice, and it usually has no effect on the person. If it's repeated more than three times, it can drastically change the condition that that person is in, it can drastically change their expressive traits. So again, in this example, we have the chunk of chromosome information three. Again, it's a string of nucleotides, it's genes, it's not just one nucleotide, it's a large chunk of genetic information. It's copied and then duplicated back into that chromosome. So we have two expressions of that gene sequence or that chunk of information. And then lastly, for those, uh, we have inversion. Ooh, there we go. We have inversion mutation. And in inversion, it results in a re reversal of a fragment of the chromosome. So in this case, with our original DNA, the sequence from head to, tel or from head to middle is one, two, three. An inversion happens when any number of those chromosome chunks or any number of those genes, the order with which they were originally in gets changed or inverted. In this case, it's three, two, one, or it can be brought all the way over to the other tail side of the chromosome, and we get an inversion information on the other side of the tail. Either way, shape, or form, it's that reversal or that reshuffling of genetic information along the chromosome. So when we look at inheriting mutations, mutations to body cells, those somatic cells, skin cells, hair, uh, lungs, kidney, what have you, they're not heritable. Mutations to gametes are heritable. So the only way with which you can pass on a mutation that's, ex that's taken on in, in the wild, so to speak, from experience in living and what have you, is if that mutation is to the gamete in the reproductive organs. Okay, I have this as a, quite an important chunk of information that people need to know. Uh, these types of mutations, they can be harmful, neutral, or beneficial. Uh, one real-world example with which we can look at is the example of sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia, if you recall from uh, previous lessons, we looked at how malaria impacted the body of a person, and we looked at how it attacks, uh, attacks their blood cells and how it makes them, the symptoms that it happens, and as a result of that, what happens to that person. In sickle cell anemia, however, when we look at red blood cells that carry oxygen, uh, sickle cells are misshapen. So when you take a look at this sickle cell, it's, it's half moon shaped as opposed to the normal red blood cell, which is that biconcave shape. In, in places where malaria is not prevalent, sickle cell is nothing but uh, harmful. It, it reduces your ability to exercise, it reduces your uh, oxygen concentration, it reduces your ability to um, metabolize resources at a high rate. So it, it can make you feel tired, weak, what have you, but it has negative impacts in places around the world that don't have malaria. However, in places where malaria is quite prevalent, uh, people with sickle cell are actually immune to the disease. The plasmodium does not reproduce well in sickle cell shaped blood cells. And as a result of that, people with sickle cell anemia are completely 100% immune to malaria. So, this is an example of a mutation that can be harmful in, to some in certain areas of the world, but also quite beneficial to other people in, in, in certain parts of the world where malaria is prevalent. Because even though the malaria is bad for you, 
uh, or sorry, even though sickle cell anemia is bad for you, malaria is significantly worse, right? People can deal with being a little bit tired and not quite having the best O2 and uh, glucose levels. But if you're sick with malaria and you die, well, that's significantly worse than just being a little tired day to day. Uh, another example that we'll talk about often, especially in Exium, is lactose tolerance and intolerance. Uh, the vast majority of people are unable to digest lactose, 75% of adults worldwide. And many people have a beneficial mutation, which allows them to digest it as they age. So many, many people within the Caucasian um, population uh, maintain that genetic mutation that allows for them to digest lactose uh, throughout their life. And then lastly, antibiotic resistance is a form of mutation that can give bacteria resistance against specific antibiotics. We looked about this in our previous unit where how um, certain bacteria strains can be made to be antibiotic resistant. It's a beneficial genetic mutation to them, but extremely harmful to us. Uh, this random change in bacteria cell allows them to survive treatment by antibiotics. Like I said, this is an important component, these types of mutations. Uh, I even drew a spider that says sickle cell is important to know, so please know it. That's what pumpkin, the pink haired spider says. Lastly, uh, mutations have serious, how do mutations have serious effects? Well, this is something called the central dogma of biology. This is something we only briefly talk about in this unit as well as this course, but it will be the main focus for grade 12 biology. So if you have aspirations of taking grade 12 biology and biology beyond grade 12, this central dogma, this idea of how genetic information and mutations have effects on us, this is going to be something you focus and study uh, quite often over the course of your academic career. So when we look at how mutations affect uh, the body as a whole, we look at the DNA that carries that sequence of nucleotides, which are the instructions within the nucleus. A process called transcription happens where it makes this messenger RNA or mRNA, which allows for that information to be carried out into the cell where the cell then translates that information from the nucleus by way of the mRNA into proteins, which are important in creating cell structures and ultimately phenotypes. So I'll give you an example. It's not something you have to know. Like I said, this is just general, general uh, central dogma of biology. But the general idea is that if your DNA carries the information for blue eyes, for example, it will create the messenger RNA to send out into the cell, your eye cells, and then that cell will then translate it into proteins that when they organize themselves in such a way, it will create the color blue, essentially. And then when light hits it, it will reflect back the blue light only, and so that's why people have blue eyes. So step one through three, when we look at the nucleus, when we look at the nucleus to RNA to protein synthesis, all three of those steps are important in determining phenotype. Again, it's not something that you desperately need to know right now, but that central dogma, the general idea of how DNA affects phenotypes, this is the gist of it. So when we look at, <laughs> I forgot to do this. So when we look at the sickle cell anemia example, a normal person would have this base pair situation unaltered and it would create this messenger RNA and then it would create this protein which allows for normal blood cell formation. The shape is biconcave. The amount of oxygen and sugar that with which it can dissolve and carry is normal for a regular human. Everything is fine unless they live in a place with high amounts of malaria then they're in trouble. Whereas with the mutated base pair that A and T switch it produces a completely different RNA sequence, which creates a completely different protein, which creates a completely different shape for the red blood cell. And as a re result of that, we see how a mutation in the DNA, a single base pair change, can lead to a protein development that is completely different from the normal trait. And like I said, as uh, these two horrendously looking spiders and octopus say, this is the most important stuff for grade 12. You really spend a lot of time on translation and trans, um, uh, transcription in grade 12. 
because it's like I said, it's the central dogma of biology. Okay, folks, that's it for this lesson. Uh, take a look at the homework. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to post them or ask them. Otherwise, enjoy. <laughs>